Je sais pas si on... Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for, for being here uh, in the late Friday. So um, just a quick presentation. So I'm uh, Jérôme Gaillardet. I'm a professor of uh, Earth Sciences at the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris, which is affiliated to the University of Paris. And by training, I'm a, I'm a geologist. So I'm coming from geology, and I got interested by environmental ecological issues uh, via something I'm going to talk about this afternoon, which is a, a, a new concept, so to say, which is a, the critical zone of the Earth. So what I want today is with you is describe what is a critical zone. It's an initiative which is coming from the natural sciences, but it's also something which is uh, important and becoming more and more important for social sciences and politics. And just to illustrate this, um, uh, my second slide is a slide of a book that was published uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which is a book of the uh, exhibition Critical Zones, which was not an exhibition uh, at the ZKM in Germany, in Karlsruhe, which was not a book about uh, natural sciences, which, but which was an exhibition about uh, where to land on Earth. And it's interesting to read uh, these few sentences here, which are on the screen here. You want me to land on Earth? Why? because we are hanging in mid air, headed for a crash. How is it down there? Pretty tense, a war zone, close, a critical zone, a few kilometers thick where everything happens. Is it habitable? Depends on your chosen science. Will I survive down there? Depends on your politics. So I think everything is summarized here. This is words from uh, Bruno Latour that unfortunately passed away a couple of weeks ago. And you can read this book. It's a very important book, a very uh, heavy book, so to say. Uh, and there are a number of articles in that book that are coming both from the natural sciences and the social sciences, which is basically uh, trying to address the, pro the problem of the, because we have, we have finished with the globalization, we are now in a new climatic regime, and we have to, uh, to uh, <clears throat> uh, atterrir in French, we have to um, land somewhere on Earth, and the critical zone is proposed as a, where, as a place where to land. And so this is another picture of this exhibition, which is now finished, but you can see, you can find on the website of the ZKM in Karlsruhe a number of uh, videos which have been recorded for the uh, uh, beginning uh, or the opening of the exhibition as well as the uh, termination of the exhibition. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, is to show you how, where does this critical zone initiative comes from. Uh, I'm not going into. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, uh, specific scientific, natural scientific questions. But I want you to have an overview of what the scientists are interested in when they talk about the critical zone, and and then finally, I I'm going to finish with a couple of uh, ideas. Even if this is not my field, a couple of uh, ideas on what this notion of critical zone changes to the to the way we can um, do uh, politics of the earth in this new climatic regime that we have, where, that where we are now, which is the Anthropocene. So basically the definition, so I'm starting with the first part section, which is, I have uh, called, named a zone of, of conflict between Helios. So Helios is a Greek uh, name for the sun uh, and and Vulcan is a Roman uh, god for, for the interior of the earth. So we are living in a, a zone, which is a zone of conflict between these two, two big sources of energy. And so if we refer to the official definition of the critical zone, it was proposed by a, the National Research Council of the United States. So a well-established council, which is trying to see what should be the area uh, where money, money should, be, should be invested in science. And so the, the, this critical zone concept was proposed by the specific council and defined as the skin of the earth, or in other words, uh, between the sky and the rocks. This is where the life is and which is so critical to better understand uh, our future. So this is really the zone, and I'm going to enter into more details uh, then after. This is a zone which where we live, basically. Where, this is a zone where all living organisms are on the planet. So if you try to think in terms of critical zone, you, you see immediately that you don't live on the planet, 
which is the, the globe, the Galilean globe, so to say, but you, you are living on a very thin layer at the surface, which is the only uh, zone of the planet which is habitable, so to say, so to say, livable. Okay, so this is a, a zone which is going to be an hybrid zone in the sense of the social sciences, which is a zone which is of interest for scientists, scientists coming from the natural sciences, but also uh, a political uh, critical object. So this is a, a representation which is very bad. Uh, if I have time, I will show you that we are working on new representation of the zone where we live. Uh, it shows you how much we lost, actually, because we don't even know how to represent the, 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 the planet we, we, we live in and not on, we live in. This is a different compartments which are connected and which are making as a whole uh, the critical zone. So when you talk about the critical zone, you have to take into account, I'm, I'm starting from, from the bottom, you have to take into account the rocks because everything is derived from rocks, actually. You have to take into account the water. It can be water which is circulating at the surface, but it can be deep water, which is circulating at depth, and which is basically of the drinking water. You have to uh, deal with the soil, and the soil, soil is a very polysemic term. Uh, the soil of the geologist is not, is not the soil from the agronomist, so behind this term soil you can uh, have a different, a large number of concepts. Uh, but you also have, of course, the ecosystems, or at least the visible ecosystems, because ecology most of the time studies the visible ecosystems, but this, there is a lot of life which is not visible, which is made, for example, of bacteria, of fungi, which are here, somewhere here at the surface, but that can go very deep. And actually, the scientists are now interested by this, what they call the deep biomass, which is this very largely unknown uh, living biomass, which is living, for example, at 100 meters be beneath our feet. And so, and you also have the lower atmosphere. So not all the atmosphere is within the critical zone. When, when you are breathing, for example, you need oxygen and you, and you put CO2 in the atmosphere, you only put the CO2 in the lower atmosphere. You're not, you're not concerned by the higher atmosphere, which is depleted in oxygen and which has almost no uh, gas in it. So this is a critical zone. The critical zone has an ensemble, uh, um, a mix of different compartments that you know, uh, all know, which are studied by specific sciences which are not connected. So the, the critical zone is not only uh, an object of study, it's also a way of reconnecting different uh, uh, objects which have been studied by different disciplines over the last, let's say, century. And this is another representation. I'm not claiming that this representation is better than the previous one. It's another representation, but it's, 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 uh, it's one of the best I can offer. So this is not a vertical view, it's a lateral view here. And it's a representation which is based on, uh, you see these blue uh, arrows here, which are representing the water cycle, the fact that water is evaporated from the ocean, precipitated on the lands, and is, uh, uh, is, is flowing to the ocean back again. And so during this water cycle, a lot of interactions with living organisms, with the rock, with the soil, with the vegetation is occurring. And, every, and all these processes are responsible for transforming the, the earth, the planet, so to say, in a habitable, in a livable uh, a pellicle in a libable zone. And the main difficulty, as I said, of the critical zone as a whole, okay, studied as a system, is that it is uh, of interest for many, many disciplines. And I have tried this game here on this slide to put uh, a number of the disciplines which are interested by what is happening in the critical zone from a scientific, from a natural science point of view. Of course, ecologists are interested by the critical zone but also microbiology, because there is a lot of microbes living, as I said, deep, deep under our feet. Pedology, I don't know if you know what pedology is. Pedology is the science of soil, soil science in, in, in the US, basically. But geophysics is very important, and I'm going to show you some pictures that are being produced. Geophysics is a way of imaging something that we basically don't see, which is beneath our feet, which is where the water is uh, stored and where the water is circulating. 
biogeochemistry, hydrogeology. So I, an hydrogeologist is a, is, is a scientist which is studying the deep groundwater. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it cannot be co uh, 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 compared with an hydrologist, which is another type of scientist. An hydrologist is studying the running water at the surface of the earth. And of course, all these disciplines are well established. You know, they have their uh, particular journals. When you know, when you are an hydrologist, you don't publish in the papers in the journals which are the journals of the hydrogeology community. Everything has been very, very separated, and that's also true in the institutional point of view. If you look, for example, at France, and I'm not claiming that France is a good example, but it's the way it is, there is an institution which is in charge by the state of monitoring the groundwater. Uh, it's a BRGM, Geological Bureau, and there is another institution which is in charge of monitoring the hydrology of rivers, the water discharge of the main uh, rivers in the country, and this is INRAE, National Research Agronomical Institute. Of course, it's kind of stupid because a river is always connected to a groundwater in any place. So, you know, separating the institution which is monitoring the hydrogeological a, a reservoir and, and from the institution which is measuring the uh, hydrological reservoir is stupid, but it's the way it is. The state has divided the monitoring and the, and the auscultation of the critical zone into ma many, many different institutions. Probably one of the main uh, challenge or difficulty in the study of the critical zone is, is that you can see, you can look at that object uh, from the bottom, so to say, or from or from the um, from the top, you can look at it as a geological object. So, and then you are going to do geosciences. You are going to look, and this is my background. You are going to look at the way rocks are being transformed into a soil, a porous medium. But you can also look at the critical zone uh, if you are a bio uh, something, a bio scientist, uh, saying that okay, everything is about you know ecosystems the relationship between the living organisms, everything is about the transfer of sun energy, solar energy into the system. So there is no, no one view and which would be correct and the other which would be uh, bad. All the views have to be reconciled and they give you an idea of the very the high, the, the high complexity of uh, the way this zone of the planet is, uh, is working. Of course, don't don't hesitate to interrupt me if something is not clear of you if you want more details. Huh? OK, so from an energetic point of view, it's, this is very impressive. If you look at how much energy the surface of the Earth, which is the habitable zone of the planet, is receiving, you see immediately you see you immediately see two sources of energy. The first one is coming from 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 the bottom. It's the internal energy of the Earth. As you know, the Earth is, is a cooling planet, okay? The Earth, the Earth is warm because it's a radioactive planet. It's containing quite a lot of radioactive elements in its interior. And these radioactive elements, by, by dis disintegrating, are producing a lot of heat. And this heat has to be um, uh, dissipated, okay? And I'm going to show you what is the uh, mechanism by which the Earth is dissipating this internal energy. Basically, what is producing, it's producing mountains, it's producing relief. So the relief which is behind, which is surrounding us is due to the fact that the earth is dynamic. And why the earth is dynamic? The earth is dynamic because the earth is being cooled by a number of processes. And I'm going to show you some of them in a minute. And the other source of energy is the sun. Of course, when you are at the surface of the Earth in the middle of July, you feel the energy that the sun is, is, is bringing to you. It's a huge amount of energy, uh, which is um, responsible for a lot of processes at the surface of the Earth. For example, photosynthesis, the fact that uh, some living organisms at the surface of the planet are able to capture the energy and make up their um, matter, their um, uh, bricks, uh, with, with, with this energy. And so if we compare in terms of, in terms of numbers, what, what are the order of magnitude of these two energy, you end up immediately with a big, big um, dissymmetry. The, the amount of energy that when you are lying here in that, in that, on the floor, you receive 
44 terawatts, so T, T, W is terawatt, it's 10 to the power 12 watts, and the watt is a, a energy, it's a joule per second. So you receive 40, 44 terawatts of energy from, in, from, from the inside Earth, and, but, you, but you receive much more, one, uh, 180,000 terawatts, which is coming from the sun. So when you are at the surface of the Earth, there is a big, big, big difference, big dissymmetry between the amount of, of energy that you receive from the sun and the amount of the energy that you receive from the deep Earth. It would be a, a mistake, an error, to consider that this source of energy is negligible. No, it's not negligible because it's playing at long time scale. And the fact that you have volcanoes on the planet, the fact that you have mountains on the planet, which are responsible for the global water cycle, is also due to the fact that you have this 44 for teragram, terawatts of, of energy, which is uh, here. Okay, and so if I uh, go into the details of what these uh, 44 uh, terawatts of uh, energy are um, implying, this is a big mechanism of plate tectonics. Maybe you've heard about plate tectonics. It's one of the big scientific discoveries from the last century. It's the fact that, as I said, the Earth is a, a worm and it's cooling. And, by, and the mechanism by which the Earth is cooled is convection. So you have in the mantle, which is the, basically the earth interior, large convection cell, which is movement. The matter is animated by large scale movements. Uh, basically, it's hot when you are deep, it's hotter. And, and so the, the heat is coming up and then it's going on laterally and then it's down um, welling uh, some, at some other parts of the, of the earth. And the important thing about the, of this convection, mantle convection, as we call it, is that the manifestation at the surface of this convection is that because the surface of the Earth is made of rigid plates, these plates are going to move depending on the movements which are uh, below. And the geologists or the geophysicists have, have known that they have divided the, the surface of the Earth the continent and the ocean in a given number, a very limited number of plates, which are moving each, uh, uh, moving each other, and which in some way, in some places are separated and in some other ways are uh, colliding, meeting. And when two plates meet, it is forming a mountain. And when the two plates are separated, because be be beneath you have this uh, convection cells, then it's creating an ocean. So plate tectonics was a big uh, scientific theory, which was able to explain all the uh, forms of the relief we observe, we observe on Earth. And plate tectonic is also explaining the uh, volcanism, volcanism process, which is represented here by a volca volcano, which is a, a very important process for the Earth on the long term. Because if you are able to breathe uh, air right now, this is because this air has, is coming from the degassing of the deep interior and has accumulated, accumulated during the geological history of the Earth in the atmosphere. Okay, so this 40... 44 terawatts of energy may appear to be small compared to the energy of the sun, but it's causing a lot of processes that are uh, uh, around us at the surface of the earth. So this is one of the major ingredients of the, uh, so to say, uh, critical zone, creating the relief and bringing gas, in particular CO2, to the atmosphere. The other source of energy is, is huge, as we, as we saw uh, earlier. It's, it's the energy from the sun. And of course, the sun is going to uh, warm the surface of the planet. And the, and the surface zone of the planet, which is, be, which is going to receive much more energy, is basically the equatorial and tropical zone. So you have an excess of energy uh, in the tropics. Uh, compared to the uh, northern or uh, southern uh, regions here. And this is a map of the mean annual temperature of the ocean and also the surface, which is very familiar to you. And basically, you can use your, your iPhone and you can have a real-time map of the temperature uh, right now. And you will see exactly the same picture, that the ocean in the tropical zone is very warm 
20, more than 20 degrees, it can, can go to 27 degrees, and it's very cold, of course, at the northern and southern latitude. And so because nature doesn't like uh, this kind of situation with a lot of inequalities, there are processes which are redistributing the heat at the surface of the Earth. And uh, one, one process which is very important and which, which is represented of this map, which is a, a map um, based on satellite data, uh, is the mean ocean evaporation. You understand very simply that if an ocean is warm, then this eva the evaporation of water is going to be much important. Uh, and so when you look at where evaporation of the ocean is occurring on Earth, you immediately see that uh, the evaporation of seawater is occurring in the, in the mid-tropical zone. Okay, so this is where the water is being produced. This water is because the water is less dense than the surrounding air. This water is going up into the atmospheric column, and at some point it condenses and it gives rain. What I'm talking here is about, I'm talking about the water cycle, which is fueled by the sun. So, okay, so the sun energy is used, so to say, by the planet to evaporate the ocean. And that's that's dissipating the, the lot of energy that the sun is giving to the earth. And this is a very sim simple view of the global wa water cycle, which is something you've, you've seen already because you, it's, it's now teached at the elementary school, but, but it's very important, you know, and that's particular of the planet. If you go to Mars or if you go to the moon, you don't have a water cycle. Really, the water cycle is a specificity of the earth. Uh, and so I don't want to go into the, the, the numbers, the, the details of the numbers here. This is not very important. Something which is very important, though, is that if you look at the total amount, so it's a thousand cubic kilometer per year of water, the total amount of water which is being evaporated over the ocean, so principally the mainly the tropical ocean, is being re-precipitated in the form of rain on the ocean themselves. Okay, so you see four, four, three, four, and three, nine, eight. So nothing is left, so to say, to uh, for precipitating on the continent on the release. Okay, and a major player in that water cycle is the vegetation. Okay, so vegetation is a source of uh, atmospheric vapor to the atmosphere. When you look at a tree, you should consider it. As, as a way of taking water in the soil and putting it back in the atmosphere, okay? This is what basically a tree does, taking water from the soil and evaporating it in the atmosphere. And that's a huge flux at the scale of the, of the planet. And that's something which is very important when we talk about the deforestation of the Amazon, everyone is saying that's a disaster. It is a disaster, but it's a disaster because of the CO2, blah, 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 in print. But actually, this is also a disaster, if not the main disaster. It's because you're suppressing this water cycle, which is giving back uh, the water to the atmosphere. So if you cut the forest in some place, you are going to make a dessert, which is something that uh, humans have known for, for centuries. Okay, and so this is a water cycle. And you see that the runoff, what we call the runoff, which is the amount of water which is circulating, finally is, is uh, redistributed to the ocean, is 36,000 36, uh, uh, cubic kilometer per year, which is almost 10% almost of what was evaporated initially. So a very small amount, and only a very small amount of the water which was evaporated by the sun energy is uh, redistributed, uh, is going back to the ocean. But you will see that this flux, even if it's a relatively small flux, has a very, very big importance. I want to draw your attention uh, here that this water cycle, which is a specificity of the Earth, which is why we have life on Earth, is not just a matter of the sun energy, which is providing the evaporation of the ocean. It's also a matter of plate tectonics, okay? You have reliefs on the continents because you have plate tectonics. If you suppress plate tectonics on the Earth, if the planet would be totally cold, non-active, you won't, you won't have a water cycle, okay? 
So again, uh, it's very important to get this perspective that the water cycle is not only a sun problem, it's also uh, uh, something which exists because the, the planet, the interior of the planet is active and is creating the relief. Of course, the water is coming originally from the deep interior because the water is mostly released to the atmosphere by the degassing by, of volcanoes, okay? When you look at the volcano, the, the steam, which is uh, we just the steam which is coming out, is mainly water and CO2. This is what we call the degassing of the Earth. Okay, and the other process which is fueled by the by the sun uh, is is very important, it, and it's also a specificity of the Earth. So I'm sorry because everything is cut. Uh, so this is photosynthesis. So you don't see the name here, but this process, which is one one specificity of the Earth, is photosynthesis. But you see the chemical equation, which is the most important. So CO2 plus, plus H2O gives, gives CH2O, which is basically the chemical formula for living organisms. We are, you are, CH2O n times. Okay, this is your chemical composition. And when plants or green plants are doing this reaction, they transform, they capture the solar energy and they transform the solar energy into chemical energy. When you eat, what you're gonna do in a couple of hours, you are going to fuel sun energy in your body because you need the sun energy to fuel you because you are not a photosynthetic uh, at least I'm not aware of that. You are not a photosynthetic organism. You're not able to do this reaction. So a, a little bit of the sun energy, and I don't want to give you the numbers. They are very, very sm small, a very little part of the sun energy, which is coming at the surface of the earth is being captured by the uh, green plants, like the trees, to produce organic matter. Okay, and so this organic matter is a form of stored chemical energy, which is originally coming from the from the sun. Okay, and what is important is what when a tree or a leaf a leaves a leaf falls on the on the floor, there is a, a, a microorganisms, microbe, bacteria, and fungi which are going to decompose it, and this is typical what nature typically what nature as uh, created during the, the long evolution of life, because if you just have a process which is consuming the CO2 from the atmosphere, like photosynthesis, very rapidly the atmosphere will be totally depleted in CO2. And so the scientists from the 19th century, such as the people de Saussure, for, for example, he was a Swiss guy which was working on the photosynthesis reaction, came up to the conclusion that there must exist a compensating mechanism of photosynthesis, otherwise there, would no, there wouldn't be any, any molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere because the plants would have consumed everything. And this is Lavoisier, the famous chemist from uh, the French chemist, which was beheaded by the revolution, by the way, that discovered this compensating mechanism, which, which is the respiration, the respiration of animals and the respiration within the fin uh, upper part, uh, the upper part of the soil. Okay, so respiration and photosynthesis are two compensating mechanisms which maintain the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, just to summarize, we are living on a thin pellicule which is just at the interface between what I've called Helios and Vulcan. This is not from me, this is a quotation from Volk 99. Uh, and we are so, so to say, uh, in that war zone. You know, the fact that Bruno Latour quotation was about talking about a war zone is exactly this. We are in a war zone, which is a conflict zone between two sources of energy. And if you look at some uh, historical perspective, it's interesting that in the history of science, this notion of the the Earth the rocky earth being transformed by the sun appeared several times. And it appeared like, for example, in Vernatsky, which was a Russian, Ukrainian Russian uh, scientist, which wrote a book in 1929 in French, by the way, La Biosphere, the biosphere, where he defined the biosphere, not by the way we define it today, which is very reducing, uh, by the way, but it defined the biosphere as the pellicle of the Earth, which is transformed 
by the energy of the sun. Transformed by what? Transformed by the water cycle, okay, which is fueled by the sun energy and transformed by the action of living organisms, which are basically uh, an chemical energy initially coming from the sun. Okay, so this biosphere concept of, of Bernatsky was much richer than the modern concept or current concept of biosphere. In, for example, if you look at the IPCC report, they're talking about biosphere, but they're not talking about biosphere in that sense. They're talking about the biosphere as, a, as, as all the living organisms on Earth, okay, which is a very poor concept compared to this concept. And there is another uh, notion uh, uh, which is important, I think, to mention is Gaia. Gaia is a theory, uh, the theory from Lovelock and Margulis, which was published a long time ago. Lovelock uh, passed away two, year, two, two years ago, uh, which is at the origin because uh, Lovelock uh, evolved during his long life on this, on this concept. But at the origin is, is, the, um, is the idea that living things are part of the planetary scale self-regulating system that has maintained habitable conditions over the past uh, 3.5 billion years. Uh, and so this is the idea that the planet is, is managing to maintain the conditions which are the best conditions for life, whatever the, the life forms are. Okay, this is important. So this is life with a cap L and not life with the different species. So um, I can tell you a little bit more about uh, what are these transformations that I'm talking about, what, what the water cycle is doing to the planet, but I don't want to be too long, so I should uh, look, uh, take a look at the time. Okay. Well, because I'm, I'm... Okay, so what is the kind of transformation that uh, geochemists like I am are interested in? So, uh, I mentioned to you the fact that the water cycle is a specificity of the Earth. And when, the, when it rains on, on a rock, for example, the rock is being transformed. Okay, the rock is being partially dissolved. And so at the interaction between this water, which is flowing at the surface of the continent and the rock, you create a porous zone. And this is very important, this notion of porosity. Porosity means that part of the mass is being uh, removed, okay? So the transformation of a rock into something which is not a rock anymore, which is something soft, which is something porous, is an important process which is occurring when uh, it rains on a rock. And basically this is not the water, and I'm not going into the details here, but this is not the water which is reacting with the rock, but this is the atmospheric CO2, because CO2 is easily dissolved in water it, it creates an acidic solution. This is a definition of, the, of acidity. So you don't see the reaction here, but this is the, on the, the second reaction of my talk, which is CO2 plus H2O gives you H2CO3 minus H2CO3, which is a carbonic acid, which is an acid, which is attacking the rocks, okay? So the fact that the surface of the earth react with the atmos atmospheric uh, water is, is due to a, a, a molecule which you don't see, but which is responsible for the transformation, which is CO2, okay? This is very important to understand. And though in details, you create a porous media. Why is it a porous media, this zone here? It's a porous media because some, some part of the mass has left. Uh, and for, for those of you who uh, 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 did a little bit of chemistry in their life, uh, matter in the form of ions, for example, the calcium ion, the, the calcium that you drink when you drink water, are being released. So when water is interacting with a rock, there is a, a couple of elements which are leaving. Very easy. They're leaving, okay, because they're soluble. So they're leaving the, the system with the water and they're going to the ocean. And because they leave, it creates porosity, okay? There's a missing component, and this missing component is being displaced to the ocean. So this is what basically what the geochemist we call chemical weathering. And chemical weathering is one of the main processes, which is basically transforming the rock, the rocky planet, the earth 
is originally a rocky planet into something which is soft, which is the soil. And this process is consuming CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay, so the double consequences of the reactions are consuming CO2 from the atmosphere and creating this porous zone at the surface of the earth, which is going to be livable. And this is pictures from life. The action of life on the critical zone is everywhere. And this is a very classic view of roots trying to find their ways between pebbles or boulders here because the roots are trying to find the nutrients because the nutrients ultimately they come from the rock. The dissolution of the rock is providing the, nutri the nutrients which are necessary for, for, tree, for the tree to grow, to grow. But you have another, which is less classic picture of bacteria. So this is a, a, a micro, micro, microscopic photography uh, of a soil <clears throat> where you see the bacteria and these bacteria are connected are connected by kind of electrical um, electrical uh, wire wires and they communicate with each other and this is a domain where everything has to be discovered we don't we don't we know nothing about about all these microbes which are living in the soils that we didn't pay attention to but they are doing a lot of the job of transforming the rock into a soil okay so this is an ongoing research field uh, a cutting edge uh, science uh, scientific field, which is uh, very important because we absolutely don't know, know, know nothing about what these uh, microbes are exactly doing. This is a picture of a rock I didn't bring with me. Usually I bring the rock with me, but because this is Friday and I'm going back home, I don't want to <laughs> carry, carry it with me. Uh, so I just show you the picture. So this is a rock I found in a quarry in Guadeloupe. Uh, and I cut it, uh, it, and so you see something which is really important. You see a rock here inside. It's it's uh, for for those of you who like who like rocks. It's an andesite. It's a volcanic rock. It has been created by a volcano. And if you look at the at this pellicle here, which is surrounding the rock, rock, it's it's coming from the transformation of the rock by the rain, water, and the CO2 from the atmosphere. So I like this image because this image is, is the Earth, basically, so to say. You have an, a planet which is rocky, the Earth, inside, but this planet has been, has been transformed at, at its outer uh, part uh, because, you, because of this chemical weathering reaction. You lost mass, you lost elements. They're going to the ocean and you uh, remain with a residue, okay? This residue, what is this residue? When you analyze this uh, material here, you find that this is basically oxides, so a general family of minerals, which is oxides and clays, okay? Clays, and the major uh, clay that we have on earth is kaolinite, kaolinite, which, which kaolin is uh, uh, used to, to produce porcelain and, and ceramics and this kind of mat material. Okay, so this is very important. The reaction of the rocks with the atmospheric CO2 and the water is producing a very porous pellicle at the surface of the earth. What I'm, what I'm calling the critical zone, it's not the soil, okay, sensu stricto. It's, it's something which is larger, okay? It's, it's, it's a critical zone, which is a transformed part of the planet at its uh, outer um, um, Part. And this is uh, the quarry in Guadeloupe where I found this, uh, this rock. Uh, and probably this rock was a, a volcanic bomb, you know, when you are uh, around a volcano, be careful because you have stones which are falling on you. They are projected by the volcano uh, and they cool down and then they can settle in, a, in, a, in the soil or in that quarry for thousands of years and they're being progressively uh, weathered and altered. So you see in that quarry, all the ingredients of the critical zone. You see uh, the rocks, um, you don't see the rocks, they are uh, much far uh, below here, but you see this uh, white stuff here is clay minerals, okay? You see this uh, red stuff here, here is uh, oxide, iron oxide, you, you do see the arable uh, soil layer, which is in the tropics, very thin. 
because organic matter is being decomposed very rapidly in the tropics, you see the vegetation. You could consider the vegetation as a produce of this critical zone, okay? So you don't separate the vegetation from, from the transformation of the rock into something, okay? So this is really uh, a nice picture of the, of the, of the critical zone in, northern, in the northern part of Guadeloupe. Why going to Guadeloupe? Because this is a tropical island, temperature is high, and when the temperature is high, all the chemists know that when the temperature is high, the chemical reactions are proceeding very fast. And this is, if you are interested by chemical wagering reactions, this is what I'm interested in. Very often you have to go to tropical area, okay? It's raining a lot, huh? don't worry. It's not uh, something which is related to the sun. Huh? And so, of course, there is water in the system everywhere because the water is circulating through the entire critical zone. You don't see it on the picture, but it doesn't mean that the water is not there and it is not uh, creating the transformation. And this is another critical zone, which is very different. It's a picture I took in Corsica. You see rocks, but you see trees. You don't have a soil in the sensu stricto, you know, the arable soil, but you have living organisms here. You have trees and they're in good shape. Okay, so why, why, why are they in good shapes? They are in good shape because th their roots are going deep in the rocks, finding the fractures, where the water is and where these chemical transformations are occurring, providing them the necessary nutrients and the water. So critical zone, I want to convince you of that, is not just the soil, okay? It's something else. It's a different way of looking at the, this very thin pellicle, habitable pellicle of the earth, okay? And I told you uh, before that we, it's very difficult, you know, to know what exactly is the, the space, which is a livable space between our feet, we don't know it because we don't see it. We are not uh, roots, you know, we're not able to explore the porous zone. So there is an indirect method which is provided by geophysics. So geophysics is a technique which consists of, you see this guy here, he has a hammer and he's knocking the, he's knocking the floor. He's creating waves like I'm creating now. And if I'm creating waves, uh, it, if I'm eating the floor at one point, if I put a, a recorder at the end of the room, I'm going to uh, record the different waves which arrive to the receptor. And then it's a very complicated mathematical treatment, but these people are absolutely ma magicians, magicians, and they are able to produce um, a pictures, image of what is beneath our feet. Okay, and so you can see one, two, three, uh, a cross section here in a small catchment in the Vosges mountains in the, in, the, in the eastern part of France. When it's shred, it means that you are in the rock, okay? So you are really eating something which is a uh, hard rock, okay? We call it bedrock in geology. And when it's blue and when it's um, dark blue, it means that it's very porous, it's rich in water, et cetera, okay? So you, you, you image, based on the geophysical um, technique, you image the depth of, of this critical zone, okay? The depth where of the material where you can store water, when you can have roots, when you can, you know, live, basically. You cannot live here, okay? No, no, no living organism is able to survive here. But all the life is concentrated within this blue, gray, uh, green, blue pellicule. Okay? This is very impressive, actually. And what is very impressive is how ignorant we have, we are, of you know, what is beneath our feet. We are able to go to Mars. We, we don't even know what is beneath our feet. Huh? This is really impressive. And so I don't want to bother you with what uh, the geochemists uh, try to uh, understand. Uh, in, for the critical zone, but basically the critical zone is a scientific uh, uh, discipline which has several big uh, over overarching questions, so to say, uh, by uh, understanding the, the processes which are occurring within the critical zone, you address the question of long-term climate evolution. Why? Because the reactions that I'm talking about are consuming CO2 from the atmosphere, and because CO2 is a greenhouse gas 
then it, it is influencing the climate of the Earth at the geological time scale. Of course, uh, one big question is water quality, because as you understood, the water quality is um, due to these uh, react reactions which are occurring in the critical zone. So if you want to predict the water, the quality of a water, of a given water, you have to model to understand what happens in the critical zone. Of course, uh, the geomorphologists, which are the people which are interested by understanding the landscape evolution, the relief evolution, are uh, critical, critical zonists in the way that they're interested by the critical zone. And don't forget that the ultimate source of nutrients on Earth is rock weathering. And you could think about phosphorus. The phosphorus, which is limiting a limiting element for, for, for the crops on Earth, is ultimately coming from the rocks, okay? The nitrogen is very abundant in the atmosphere. The carbon is abundant in the atmosphere. But the phosphorus, which is one of the essential elements in your body, is only coming from the rock. And the way phosphorus is released is via chemical weathering reactions. Okay, so this is something very important. The phosphorus you have eaten, eaten at uh, lunch is coming from Morocco because, because chemical weathering reactions are not fast enough. And, and, and so the reactions are not producing the necessary phosphorus fast, fastly enough. So, and, and we need to put phosphorus in our crops to sustain the agricultural production. So this is very important. And so I'm going quite rapidly. Um, yeah, I have far too much slides. And so second uh, paragraph was to give you a couple of ideas of how we scientists, we try to get organized to develop a, a critical zone science. So we are working in uh, sites, okay? In what we call the critical zone observatory. So critical zone observatories, I'm going to show you some examples of networks, are sites where all the disciplines, because as you saw, there are numerous disciplines which are interested by the critical zone. So at a given place, the different disciplines are working together. Okay, this is the idea. Uh, I don't know the English name, but in, in French, we have a term which is tiers lieu. Okay, a place where, uh, kind of a neutral place where the different people go and work together. Okay, outside of the lab. And so this notion of critical zone observatory is very important. And so in critical zone observatories, we try to make monitoring because if you want to understand the critical zone, you have to monitor it on a, on a high frequency, temporal frequency, and over a long period of time. There's no way you can go and sample a river uh, one day and go back to your lab and publish a paper. It's not the way you are going to understand what is happening in the critical zone. You need monitoring. And of course, monitoring is very difficult, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it's human resource consuming. But this is a way we need to uh, address the scientific questions that I've showed you before. Um, all the critical zone observatories are anchored, so to say, on an initial overarching and, 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 and local question. I'm going to show you some examples of an observatory which was designed, for example, to study the action of acid rain in uh, back to the uh, 19, uh, 90s uh, on forests. Um, and because these critical zone observatories are place-based, by comparing different places, we can look at the effect of one or several factors, for example, uh, you want to look at the effect of climate change, you will choose several critical zone observatories along a climate gradient, okay? So you can choose, uh, uh, for example, a, a river which is draining one single type of rock in a tropical climate and the same in a temperate climate and the same in an Arctic climate, for example. And so you make, you make climate as a variable, you vary climate, by keeping, keeping constant the other parameters. This is kind of a theoretical scheme, but this is to explain the fact that these critical zone observatories are natural laboratories, okay? You see what I mean? It's, I'm not able in the lab to understand what is exactly happening in nature, 
So I try to use nature as a laboratory. This is one of, one of the key ideas. And so the, this is an international, so this is exactly what I was talking about. So this is an international initiative which have been developed over the last uh, 10, 20 years. So this is um, an image of the uh, NSF, so National Science Foundation in the United States funded uh, network. I'm not going into the details. If you are interested by the details, there is a web page. There is a lot of information on the US CZO sites. You can Google it and very rapidly you will find a lot of information. So what is interesting in the, in the United States network is that they, they tried, my colleagues, my dear colleagues, try to avoid the presence of humans. <laughs> this is really imp impressive. The way these observatories have been uh, developed, installed in places where no one lives. And this is very interesting. In, it's it's, it's a, a, remain, a remaining of the uh, wilderness uh, concept that the US scientists uh, like a lot. In France, we did something different because I, actually in France, we have a lot of existing, we had a lot, of ex existing observatories, but as I said earlier, these observatories were very dis dispersed. So you had observatories looking at the glaciers, you had observatories looking at the wetlands, you have observatories looking at the groundwater, you have observatories looking at the rivers, etc. So we tried to build up a network. And I think this is something which is very important in order to connect the different disciplines which are necessary to be uh, investigated, to understand the critical zone as a whole, as a system, you need to connect the scientists. And this is really um, making networks, okay, which is very important. And I'm uh, responsible for, I'm coordinating the national French network, which is called OSCAR, Observatoire de la Zone Critique, uh, Observatories of the Critical Zone at the scale of uh, France. And we are now engaged in a European infrastructure. We are building uh, an, a European infrastructure to connect the different observatories, uh, not only at the national level, but also at the European uh, level. I'm not going to talk about these details. I have some flyers of the infrastructure if you are interested in. Uh, I probably took them with me. Yeah, I have a couple of them if you are interested. So uh, this is just uh, a map of where these observatories are. What, what's something which is interesting with the French uh, organization that have invested um, in the instrumentation of the critical zone is the fact that we are collaborating with a number of countries from the southern uh, a tropical, uh, tropical part of the world which are mainly uh, countries from South America, countries from Central Africa, uh, India, and, and, uh, and some uh, countries in South uh, Asia. Of course, these regions are critical uh, because environmental ch changes, global changes are going to be far much pronounced here in Africa than they are in, in, in continental France. The, the environmental problems are much more critical in those regions that they are in France. And so this is absolutely important to get a global network of critical zone observatories. I probably don't have time to show you examples, but I wanted to show you one example, which is the Strengbach Critical Zone Observatory in the Vosges Mountain. So it's an observatory, as I said, which was designed, set up, because back in the 90s, you were not born at that time. I was born. And this was a main, you know, environmental uh, issue at that time was acid rains. All over Europe, trees, forested ecosystem were suffering from acid rain issues. And you had at that time these horrible pictures of forests totally, um, which were dying, dying uh, under the influence of acid, acidic rain. What does it mean, acidic rain? It means a rain with a pH of one or two. Uh, and maybe you're not familiar with pH, but one or two is something that you, when you put a, a liquid on your tongue, which has a pH of one, you say, wow, it's, it's, it's hurting you, okay? And the rain was at that pH value. So imagine you are a tree and you receive a pH, a rain which has a pH of one, you're not going to be very healthy. And so at that time, the scientists decided to look uh, over the long period of time of the effects 
of acid rain and they tried to understand uh, what, what was the cascade of chemical reactions, the perturbation induced to the critical zone by this acidic rain uh, problem. And so they did a lot of work and, and I'm just showing you one figure, which is very impressive, which is <coughs> that you can find on the website, <coughs> sorry, of the observatory, which is the sulfate concentration in the river, in the stream. So the Strengba is, is a stream, is a small stream. And the sulfate concentration is an indicator of uh, the acidity, basically. Okay, because I didn't tell you, but the acidity of acid rain is coming from a sulfuric acid. And the sulfur from the sulfuric acid is coming from the industry. The fact that at that time, most of the European industry was burning a bad quality core containing a lot of sulfur and was creating a lot of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. And so by looking at the sulfate, you got an idea in the river, you got an idea of how much the acid rain issue has evolved with time. And fortunately, you do see because uh, measures have been taken by the European industry and basically the European industry has disappeared. Huh? So there's no problem. It's in China now that the problems are, but you do see this decrease, this long-term decrease of sulfate concentration in the stream indicating that basically the good message is, uh, uh, is that the good news, sorry, is that it's decreasing. So the acidity is uh, decreasing. Um, and, and so the health of the stream is becoming uh, more and more, uh, is, is, is getting better. Uh, but superimpose on the long trend, which is this long trend, decreasing trend, you have a lot of small waves. You see that? And, and you have peaks in some years. And this is something we don't understand. Okay, so basically you see that the information which is contained on that diagram is very important because it's, it's showing something which is very important, which is we don't exactly understand the consequences of this acidic rain at the, at the local scale, at the scale of this particular ecosystem in the Vosges mountains. You do see something else, and I could have shown uh, more recent data here, is that the decrease of the acidity of the stream is, has stopped. It's no longer true that the acidity of the river is decreasing. And the people which are working on that have shown that this is due to the emission of sulfuric acid by the industry in China. So it's a local place which is instrumented, but in these places, in the Vosges mountains, in the middle of nowhere, you do see the inference, the global inference of the atmospheric circulation, which is bringing back to Europe, so to say, the sulfur from the, from the industry that has been delocalized in China. And so, yeah, something I like to show to my funders is that if I just look at the system during three years, which is a typically a time period of a PhD thesis, I do nothing, I see nothing, okay? I need, um, sorry, I need this uh, uh, 50 years of monitoring. Otherwise, I cannot tell anything on the way the system is responding and on the way the system is working. Okay, so very important. Uh, if you're interested, there is a movie uh, on the web, on the YouTube, which uh, you can look, which is uh, showing how this place particularly is instrumented. There's a lot of instruments everywhere. Each of, the, each of these instruments um, seeing something different. And so I'm coming to my last uh, part. And as I said, uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not a social scientist, but uh, I have been involved with a uh, social scientist in uh, a new adventure, so to say, which is I was very surprised at the beginning that this critical zone concept was of interest for social scientists, for police policymakers, for artists also. So what does it change us to the earth politics in the Anthropocene? So of course, the critical zone is, is also critical because this is the, the place where we live. And so we have to take care of this very thin pellicule of the surface in which we are, so to say, confined. And so it changes a lot, okay? Because if you realize that you're not living on the planet, but you are living in a very, very thin pellicule at the surface of this planet, it's, it totally changes your view on, on you know, the relationship you should have with the, with the, with the planet. 
And uh, of course, we have uh, not been very kind, so to say, with the critical zone. We, we have polluted the critical zone. We have introduced very uh, long living molecules in the critical zone, which are basically killing the microbes and the numerous fungi which are doing this transformation. So we are just stopping the transformation of the critical zone. We have, with cities, we have um, created a lot of impervious surfaces. So we have stopped the water cycle, so to say. We have fall, the water which is falling from the rain cannot infiltrate anymore. So again, we have stopped this uh, natural transformation of the planet into the livable uh, livable pellicle and on the top you can see this horrible picture of a soil which has been uh, worked out by a farm farming which is being totally destroyed i didn't take time to give you the order of magnitude of the transformation of the velocity of the amount of time it takes for a rock for being transformed into a soil but it takes a lot of time it takes typically thousands of years, okay? To create one meter of soil, the transformation that I've been talking about, it takes it takes 1,000 years. And, and with agricultural um, uh, practices, industrial farming, you can destroy the soil in like 40 years and, and probably less, okay? So we are doing things, and particularly we are doing things at such a velocity that it's not absolutely not sustainable. And I like this image of the critical zone seen as a system where the different compartments are interconnected, which is destabilized, you know, by human activity. So we have changed the whole system. So it's not a, a question of uh, humans against nature. It's something that man has uh, provoked, has um, made of uh, changing all the relationship, all the tight relationships, interconnections between the different compartments of the critical zone. And I don't want to go into the details here, but just if you're interested, a colleague of mine wrote a book, which is Dirt. And if you're interested, it's really interesting to read. It's, it, its subtitle is The Erosion of Civilization. So is um, taking the um, idea that developing the idea that uh, a civilization, in order to be sustainable, has to take care of, of the soil. But the soil he's talking about is a critical zone I have been uh, describing before. He's a very good speaker, so you can look at his uh, YouTube uh, channel and you can you can see a lot of, uh, you can find a lot of resources if you're interested. He, he showed something which is very interesting. This is uh, um, physical erosion. What this physical erosion is, is the amount of material which is being removed each year by natural processes. And he, he, he did a big uh, compilation from literature data. Uh, you see that this uh, physical erosion at the surface of the earth is changing a lot depending on where you are. If you are uh, on the shield areas, sorry, it's in French, bouclier means shield areas like, like Northern Scandinavia, Canada, uh, Siberia, this very flat area. The uh, denudation of the earth, the natural denudation is very slow, okay? Uh, one, 10 to the minus three millimeter per year, it's nothing. Okay, if you go to uh, Colin is hill, hill slopes, it's a little bit higher. And of course, if you go to mountains, it's, it's uh, much, much higher. Okay, and on that diagram, it plotted, it compared the natural numbers with what uh, conventional, so-called conventional agriculture is doing. And actually, it's a lot of uh, data, people that have measured the way uh, agricultural land is being eroded. You do see that human, the, the action of human is equivalent to uh, mountain ranges, okay? Because in mountains, you have steep slopes, and when you have steep slopes, the erosion is much higher. So this is one argument to me of the Anthropocene. The, 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 the action of man on the erosion of the earth is the same as what you observe naturally in high mountains, okay? And so this is not sustainable. We are destroying the living pellicle of the earth if we don't pay attention to the critical zone. So a couple of ideas of what 
this concept of critical zone change to uh, to uh, to the politics. Uh, so as I said, the critical zone is an hybrid object. Okay, uh, I gave you the point of view of a natural scientist, but I could have invited uh, a social scientist, and he would have talked about this critical zone as a place to land. Okay, and so it's really an hybrid object. Critical zone science calls for an alliance of all natural sciences, and there is a lot of work. Uh, it's impressive the way the disciplines are not able to talk to each other. Really, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating at all, okay? And so it's true for ecology and geology, for example, not talking about sociology, okay? Do you know any of uh, any sociologists that took a geology uh, class at the university? No. So it's something that needs to be uh, uh, totally uh, rethink. Anthropology, arts, and politics. Of course, as I, I try to show you, the critical zone is where we live, okay? We're not living in the globe. We're living this very thin pellicule at the surface of the earth. There is no exterior. We have within it, it okay? We confined in it, so to say. So it's a new way of um, uh, thinking of our, our relationship with so-called nature. There's no nature and humans. We are within a system and we are interacting with it and we are changing it. We are in the critical zone. We are one of the drivers. I don't want to go into the details, but it was developed by Bruno Latour in a, a couple of books. Uh, for, for Latour, the critical zone is uh, the materiality of Gaia. Okay, So Gaia, this uh, self-regulating uh, system, uh, is materialized by this critical zone, this very thin pellicule at, at the surface of the, of the Earth, in which the living organisms work to maintain the conditions of, the, of life. On the planet. And so uh, this is books about Gaia. I don't know if you're familiar with the Gaia theory, but this is, I've, I'm going to give you this uh, PowerPoint and so you, you can have the references. This is some of the books that you can read if you're interested by Gaia. But if you read about Gaia, you read Lovelock's books, but you, you should also read Lynn Margulis' book because the Gaia theory actually was invented by two a uh, scientist, uh, Lovelock, which was an engineer, and Lynn Margulis, which is often forgotten, but uh, forgot, but which is very important. She was a microbiologist, and she was the first to say, okay, you have a lot of bugs everywhere, microbes everywhere, that you don't even see, you don't even know that they, that they exist, but your life is possible because they are walking uh, 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 right now, okay, because they're producing the oxygen for the air, because they are decomposing the organic matter, etc. Uh, and also something which is very important, critical zone is place-based, okay, this is very important. When you talk about critical zone, you're not talking about the global, okay, you're not talking about something that is very far from you, you're talking about something which is really local, you know, which is where the people live. Okay, so you may not be sensitive to the global, but when you are living somewhere, you are attached, so to say, to local features. Okay, so you are attached to the relief, you are attached to the river, you are attached to the kind of rock that can be extracted, etc., etc. And so this is what uh, Bruno again uh, developed in his. Uh, uh, at the end of his uh, career, which was that the critical zone are the places to to learn, to redefine the best politics, um, uh, which is politics in the sense of coexisting with the planet, okay? We, as a, as a living species, we need, we have no choice to co co coexist with the planet. Uh, there is a, a, an important thing, which is that I told you already, and I'm not going to details here, but I, I want to give you some uh, references if you're interested. We one of, one of our problem, I think, is we don't have the good representation of where we live, actually. So we're still living in you know, the post-Galilean uh, era, okay? We have the, this idea that we're living on the planet, this blue marble that uh, the astronomes uh, that took photography of when they left the Earth. But we don't have very good representation. And I have been working with... Uh, 
uh, Alexandra Aren, which is an architect of trying to develop new ways of representing where we live, the critical zone. And this is just, I'm not going into the details, but this is the conventional view, uh, the Earth's mantle, the Earth core, the, the crust, et cetera, the atmosphere. Oops. And this is the new view, which is totally inverted, so to say. So in the center, you have the atmosphere. Then you have the top soil. Then you have the, the soil of the geologist, which is called the saprolite, my white stuff on the, on the slide I showed you in the quarry of Guadeloupe. And then I have the, the, the interior of the deep, which is at the periphery. So it's a, totally an inversion of the, of the representation of the globe, because we're not living on that, uh, on that globe. We're living on that, on that one. Okay, We are inside this. Uh, critical zone here. So if you are interested, you can look uh, at uh, Alexandra Aren's work. We wrote a paper. And if you're interested, uh, you also could have a look at this uh, Terraforma book, which was written by Frederica Tuati, which is uh, an artist and a social scientist uh, working at, uh, in Paris. Uh, and which was co-signed by uh, Alexandra Aren, which is an architect, and, uh, Ale and, uh, and Grégoire, which is also an architect. So this is one, I'm not going to the details, but this is an architect view of our planet, okay? We're living here, we're living inside, uh, and, uh, and the center of the planet, and the center of the, of the globe is at the periphery, because actually we don't care about the, peri the center of the, world, of the globe. We are not going to live in the mantle of the of the planet because it's too warm because the pressure is far too high so we're really confined in that in that zone so i i can show you can refer to this uh, book if you are interested and also and i'm going to finish uh, on that uh, if you are interested there are a couple of papers uh, which are uh, important in this um, catalog of the exhibition critical zone that we uh, organized in Karlsruhe a couple of years ago. So this is Où atterrir and Où suis-je, which has been uh, by uh, Latour, where he develops this idea that uh, the critical zone is the place to land. So we have the choice between the global, but we don't want the global anymore, or we have the choice of or, or coming back to the ancient times, uh, but we don't want that. So we need to find an uh, in-between. And this in between is to um, is 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 well developed in down to earth politics in a new climatic regime, where basically the critical zone is a place to land. Uh, and these books have been, of course, translated uh, into many uh, languages, different languages. And I uh, think you may be interested in reading them if you are uh, if you want to know more about the political consequences of this. Uh, of these notions, I'm giving you some references here and some YouTube uh, uh, videos if you're interested. And this is my conclusions. I'm not going to read it because we should maybe take some time for the questions. Yeah, just I brought with me a couple of reprints of the uh, introduction of the catalog. Uh, but it's a text by Bruno Latour, which is quite well summarizing the situation. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I had um, <clears throat> two questions to ask. So the first one is you, you were saying that the contact of the acid with the rock generates this, uh, releases these ions that are like very important, like phosphorus or, or calcium. So is there any study on the net effect between the degradation related to this acid on, um, on nature, let's say on trees and plants and the actual release of fertilizers or, 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 or elements that are needed for, for life? And then uh, just a comment, um, I, I've been growing back home using trichodermas, fungi and, and, and bacteria, and it's incredible. Like you really increase the crop and, and you can like not use pesticides, for example, because that makes the plant stronger and like very good and resilient against uh, plagues. But the thing is that it's really expensive. Like, uh, like the, the difference between that 
kind of agriculture or and using pesticides and sorcerers from Morocco, it's like huge. So I guess the problem so far it's a term of 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 money, no? Like uh, really, these alternatives of 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 growing are, as you were saying, not enough uh, studies on, on the side of the science, but also like economically, like very relevant. So just wanted to point it out and ask you all about this. Yes, yeah, so, so, so uh, just answering to your first question. Uh, yes, so this is typically what we try to do, budgets of, uh, you know, positive action of CO2 in the transformation and the negative effect of other processes that man has introduced or changed. So everything is about, you know, making the budget and this is really difficult. And this is where you need this monitoring, long-term monitoring at places where you uh, can conclude uh, what, what is happening. Of course, you cannot do that everywhere on the planet. Huh? And so these critical zone observatories are the places where the processes and the budgets are made in order to be uh, upscaled at the global scale via numerical models, for example. Huh? But this is typically what we try to do, because yes, uh, in order to predict the consequences on, on a new agricultural practice, etc., it's, it's difficult if you don't have long-term observation, okay? Because most, this is something which is very important, you know, very often we take an ecological um, uh, decision and, and we just look at the very short-term consequences, ignoring the long-term consequences, which can eventually be worse, you know, that, that, that the consequences we wanted to, to, to correct. So, you know, these very long-term uh, timescales are very important. Of course, they are not in the political agenda because, you know, when you are elected, you are elected for five years and then you want to show that you did something. But the natural processes are not on a five years time scale. You know, <laughs> I have been talking about processes which are, as you saw, uh, million year time scales. Huh? So this is really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, I really liked how you connected the two parts and that there was also the one on the like politics of it all. Um, but I want to get to the first one and I'm sorry if it's a stupid question, but um, uh, you were talking about the water cycle and also about like how mountains are created. And um, uh, but I also always wanted to ask how rivers are created because no one ever explained to me um, satisfactory uh, about like how does the water goes up and how is it possible it is so much of it so that's just one like curious question and then i was thinking about like so this is the kind of very systemic um viewpoint and you were talking about like yeah people live locally on one place and they uh kind of like not see this naturally you know like you just don't see the climate and water cycle move in this yeah. global scale so how would you um like proceed with the communication of okay. the systemic okay. um very good questions i have answers to both um first question is how does it work for the water to go up that's your first question it's an interesting question so if you take for example the evaporation of seawater so water when it's liquid uh, the different molecules of water are linked by what we call chemical bonds, okay? And, and when the sun, the energy from the sun is arriving, these bonds are being uh, excited, so to say. And at some point, they're broken. And then, so you don't have a liquid anymore. You have molecules which are independent. And molecules which are independent, it's what we call a gas, okay? And so the water is going up. And because the gas is less dense than the liquid, it's going up. So all the the ah, yes. Yes, but be careful. Be careful. Huh? When you see a river increasing its water because it's raining, this is not the water of the rain which is that you observe in the river. The river has infiltrated and, I, and has pushed some other water which was there existing before the rain okay be careful huh? i don't think if you make a pool in the in the street you will get a, 
evidence that everyone has understood that the rain is not flowing at the surface okay and and when the next time it's gonna rain look at the rain the rain is infiltrating into the ground and then it's going uh, indirectly into the river <laughs> it's interesting that we do some basic hydrology today and your second question was uh, local uh, how to yes i think uh, the scientists are, haven't haven't not been very good in communicating with the public and one way and this is one of the reasons why you know the scientists they keep saying ah oh, we are going straight into the wall we need to do something this is a uh, uh, this movie, uh, don't look up movie. Okay, we are alerting, but nothing is happening. And I think this is because we have a very bad and poor communication. And one way of doing, of improving the situation is to equip the citizens like you, but you are not a normal citizen, but all the citizens with sensors, with, you know, participating to the, to the fact that something is happening, okay? And then the people will get much more involved and much more uh, sensitive to the ecological uh, question. This is what we are developing at least. We have a big project, which is called Terraforma, by the way, which is developing uh, low cost sensors. Of course, it, it has to be low cost. You're not going to give a, a machine, a big mass spectrometer to a, a citizen association. It's not going to work. It has to be simple okay, and efficient. But I think the scientists, and I take my part of responsibility, we have been very bad, you know, in communicating with the public. We, we have too much the image that the scientist knows what is going to happen and, uh, and explain, you know, to the, to the politicians or to the policymakers what is going to happen. And I think, I think it's a very wrong way of communicating. Okay. Yes, um, I wanted to ask uh, you about uh, geothermal energy ah. and what like your general, um, because like I've heard it a couple of times, like from like climate people and stuff, it's like maybe a option because it's like renewable and infinite energy, but I guess like for the environment okay. and the whole soil structure is really bad. Yeah, very good question. It's a number I didn't comment on, but maybe you saw it on one of my slides. You remember deep, deep energy, 44, sun energy, a lot. And I, and I wrote at the end of the, of the slide, human energy. The human conception of energy is in the order of magnitude of 15 terawatt in the same mag So we are consuming half of the, of the global energy, which is coming from the deep earth which is a good and a bad news, okay? The good news is it's the order of magnitude. The bad news is that imagine you multiply by two the number of people on the planet. You, don't, you, you cannot rely only on geothermal energy. But to answer to your question, I think geothermal energy is a fantastic source of energy that has been totally, totally, totally uh, uh, underestimated. And if you take, for example, a country like the United States of America, they have a plan B, everything is ready. And the, the day where the, the gas and, and, and coal and petroleum will be too expensive, they will, they will shift immediately to the 100% geothermal energy. Everything is ready. It's just a matter of uh, you know, financial uh, constraints. Yeah, and in France, we are very stupid in France because we have a lot of uh, geothermal uh, resources. But uh, maybe you've heard about this issue last year in Strasbourg. So Strasbourg, Alsace, in the east of France, is one of the places where geothermal energy is fantastic. You can even do low temperature geothermal energy, which is you can boil water with it, and, send, and then you can make electricity with that. But you know, you know what happened? The company, which is in charge of uh, recovering the hot water uh, beneath Strasbourg, uh, didn't respect the rules or the advices that were given by the scientists and then earthquakes occurred the day of Christmas last year. So all the population get, you know, terrified, you know, what is happening? Oh, they're changing the earth. We don't want geothermal energy. 
And so it we 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 it it was just like a big a big uh, you know a disaster because this source of energy is a fantastic energy. It's renewable. It's not infinite, as I said, but you know in the transition we need to make, it's a fantastic source of energy. As you as you understood, I'm a pro uh, <laughs> geot geothermal energy guy. Um, so it's a comment and then a question. Um, first, like, thank you for coming this evening here because you basically gave me the framework I was looking for my thesis. So thank you very much. Uh, so the question is, um, usually when we see economic modeling and they try to introduce life in it, it's always one channel. It's like always first you see the economics and then you see the impacts on environment and then you you go to impact on biodiversity and life and you never see the the impacts back of biodiversity into the system um and i wanted to know i mean this the gaia idea and obviously the the critical zones depends on these apparently by what you presented today how i don't know if you have any ideas of where to start for example looking for this and if you were supposed to work with a models that and take this interaction between the environment and biodiversity. Um, how would you see this feedback coming from biodiversity into environment and then into social mm -hmm. sphere? Um, how would you think it would be a starting for it? And uh, yes, that's it. Thank you. So I'm not sure I understood everything, but but you are addressing a point which is, I think, a crucial point. Uh, biodiversity is one thing, and we have to protect it, etc. Okay, this is a heritage. But what these different organisms are doing to the system yeah. is another thing, okay? And if I would, I, say, I would like to be provocative, I would even say that we don't need the biodiversity. We just need to keep the engineer species, the species that do the job, the species that weather the rock into a soil, the species that decompose the organic matter into the soil because our existence rely on these species particular species but of course it's a provocative and very wrong uh, statement because biodiversity is is a way i mean nature is highly redundant uh, and when you cut something then it's resilient because you have you have another pathway and i think biodiversity allows these different pathway to exist in case of one being uh, shut down but Actually, we are very, very far from knowing what is uh, uh, what is a functional biodiversity. You know, we don't even know biodiversity. By the way, the number of species is changing every day. We are discovering new species every day. In particular, these guys, which are living beneath our, our feet, are, are most of the time totally unknown. Huh? Uh, I have a lot of colleagues which are uh, using a PCR to identify the genes of these bacteria because these bacteria are not uh, cultivable. You cannot grow them in a laboratory. They don't like to be uh, in jail, so to say. And, don't, and so, and so uh, we don't know, you know, the biodiversity of all these bugs living uh, at 100 meters below our feet. But but more importantly, we don't we don't know what they what what they do, you know. And this is very difficult, you know. This is very difficult. This is one of the this is one of the issue. Sorry. No, and so from an economical point of view, this is this is an additional uh, difficulty, you know. Yeah, yeah. You were thinking of you know paying them or. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's an idea, huh? you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Paying nature, natural process, uh, giving an economical value to natural processes. Yeah, I think it's a serious, very serious matter. But we are very far from being. No, no, it's an important question. Huh? We are very far from being able to do that. Very, very far. Um, I was wondering just when you were talking about um, engaging with like broader citizenry or like um, outside of people outside of this, like maybe we could say Western uh, field of scientific research. And I was kind of curious whether in your disciplines, like there's any engagement with 
other forms of knowledge or yeah I don't know um yeah indigenous forms of knowledge or outside of the western purely scientific frame of thinking about these sort of things uh, yes, I would say that uh, personally, I'm not uh, working on, on this, but I have colleagues, yes, which are taking into account indigenous knowledge or even not indigenous, uh, the traditional way that our farmers here in France or in central, in, Euro in Western Europe were considering the relationship they had with the, with the planet, which was very different, which was very destroyed by the economical growth from the after the second war uh, so yes uh, there is a so I, I presented you the, um, the Oscar uh, Observatoire de la Zone Critique Critical Zone Network but there is another network I didn't mention which is a zone atelier network which is a socio-ecological network I can provide you with some references and in that network uh, they also have a, a, a number of observatories or platforms, and they are trying to co-construct the research question with the stakeholders. So this is basically a, a very different approach. Huh? And I know that in a number of these uh, sites or platforms, regions, um, indigenous, so to say, or native, so to say, knowledge is, is, taken, is, taken, into, is taken into account. Yeah. So it's not... A, it, it, it exists, uh, but you know, for, for a physicist or a chemist uh, to be aware that this is a, uh, a non-exotic form of knowledge, uh, it's a long uh, way, huh? uh, <laughs> but, but it's changing. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. I had two questions. Like first, uh, why the water in the sea is salty? First one. <laughs> And second question, what do you think about the uh, desalination projects? What, okay. uh, what so is the, the potential question, of desalination? Desalination, de desalination? Desalination of water? Yeah. Of seawater? Yeah, exactly. So first question, actually, if you understood what I said, you, 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 have, or you already have the answer. Well, I guess that the, 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 the submarine, which is like the rock is salt. I guess two and then move to the water. Part, yeah, part, partly, but but also the rivers contain uh, ions, calcium, potassium, etc., which are coming from chemical weathering reactions. The, the transformation I tried to explain to you, and and if you integrate that over the uh, long geological history, everything is accumulating into the ocean. So the ocean is kind of the the, the trash the junk uh, place where everything is just accumulating. And so that's true for sodium, that's true for chloride, etc. And this is why seawater became salty with time. Yeah. <laughs> and desalinization, uh, I have no special opinion, except that this is, uh, this is very expensive. And so it's producing a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. So I don't consider it as a, as a way to, but, but you know, uh, yeah, something which is important. So uh, the global runoff to the ocean. So the global, the total amount of water, which is flowing from the continent to the land is 36,000 uh, cubic kilometer per year. We, we use about 5,000. So we have enough, you know, we don't need to 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 desalinize uh, seawater. At some places, it can be a necessity, and but but on a on on the global scale, we have enough, so to say, fresh water. Yeah. Um, uh, because you mentioned uh, Lynn Margulis, who um, contributed a lot with her theory of uh, endosymbiosis. Uh, how can we connect the notion of endosymbiosis with uh, geology? Endo, endosymbiosis? This endosymbiosis, is what, yes. So the theory which was developed by Lynn Margulis? Yes. How does it connect with geology? Yes. Uh, well, it's easy. Uh, so the, the when you look at the... The evolution of life on the planet it started by very primitive forms 
like probably, probably our common ancestor is Luca, a last universal common ancestor was a very simple cell, which was um, with no, um, uh, yeah, very simple cell, just. Uh, and then with time, the different, uh, these different very primitive organized uh, associated themselves in a symbiotic form. And this is a theory which was develop, developed by Lynn Margulis, by the way, which is called endosymbiosis. So for example, in your cell, the mitochondria, which is uh, the small part of the cell which is producing the energy you need, maybe, maybe an independent organisms in the past that uh, before this symbiosis uh, get invented. So it's just with time, it started with very primitive forms of life. Um, that we still find, uh, for example, if you look at uh, people found uh, life forms in very, very hot boiling water, for example, in Iceland, at 120 degrees, you still find organisms which are living there. It's incredible, huh? but they are very simple forms. They're not, uh, you cannot live in that, at that temperature because you are too much sophisticated. In order to survive at that temperature, you need to be very, very simple, you know. And these very primitive forms have, have evolved. Uh, the invention of this endosymbiosis gave birth to the eukaryote. We are eukaryote uh, living forms. And so we are kind of a, yeah, a sophisticated form of life. And so the evolution after the endosymbiosis was invented the evolution of life uh, got really, really important. So just a final question. You were saying that the acid um, the, like changes, like so the carbon is, is, is trapped and, and it can change into other things on soil. But what about when it falls in the ocean? Because you show that most of the water just goes up and then comes back to the ocean. Like wh what happens to the, um, so like the acid in, on the ocean? Yeah, yeah good question. So um, there is a natural equilibrium between the CO2 in the atmosphere and the CO2 in the ocean. Uh, so it's, this is what is happening right now because we have introduced a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere by burning fossil uh, fuels. And so the CO2 has accumulated in the atmosphere, but part of it is being dissolved in the ocean. This is a natural process. Huh? The problem is that this natural process is acidifying the ocean. And so the ocean, the pH of the ocean, I could have showed you data on that, is decreasing. So uh, a, century, a century ago, the pH was 8.3, which is a natural, natural pH of the ocean. And now when you swim, you swim in a water which is 8.1. You could, you could consider it's nothing, but, because, but it's a huge change. And if you extrapolate the way the pH of the ocean is going to decrease, it's probably going to decrease to uh, 7.8, which is a big, big, big change. So I think the acidification of the ocean is a problem that is also very, uh, uh, and uh, consider it, it's a, it's a big issue. Huh? It's a big issue. Climate warming is, is a big issue, but the acidification is a, of the ocean is a, is a catastrophe because it's going to destroy, to destabilize all the oceanic ecosystem. So the only solution is, you know it, stop it right now, okay? To follow up on that issue, then what do you what do you think about this um, solution with um, kelp um, kelp reforestation and is it pos is it a is it a good way to sort of fight against the acidification of the ocean, restoring kelp beds? Because I know in the Pacific there's you know been a lot of loss of uh, kelp forests, what so is it? the kelp forests. Kelp, kelp forest. No, sea uh, alga, seaweed. Seaweed. Yeah, the, it's the they're like under the underwater forest. So um, okay, okay. Um, there's some 
emerging info, I guess, but it's been around for a while. So planting these uh, algae to remove the CO2, is that is that? Yes, the idea? they would act like carbon sinks. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not aware. Yeah. I'm okay. Aware. Yeah, because there's some there's there's more info about that. I think happening in the Pacific Ocean area because okay. we we okay. they've lost a lot, and so what they're saying is, you know, there's thousands of miles of of kelp that can be restored, but there it's with the threat of like privatization and all this commercialization, it could become like the Amazon, but we're ignoring the underwater forest, something like that. So there's not much information on this. I'm not aware, but I'm aware of another experiment that was conducted uh, back in the 70s, which was uh, disseminating iron at the surface of the ocean with the idea that if you give more iron to the, to the plankton, the plankton is going to grow faster and so to pump CO2 from the atmosphere. And it was a it was a real experiment. The people fertilized the ocean with iron, and what happened after a couple of years? So exactly what we said earlier. Okay, first of of course you dim, you diminish you 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 decrease the amount of CO two in the atmosphere because this plankton is pumping CO two, but this plankton is going to die, and and when dying is going to after die it's going to settle. To settle at the at the bottom of the ocean and then being recomposed, decomposed by by the organisms which are living here in the sediment. So actually, uh, the CO two has came back to the atmosphere. So it's an effect on a small term, but on the long term, it's not going to be an effect because the organic matter you have produced is going to be decomposed. So the only way I imagine your your story could work. Is that you take the al al algae, algas, okay. uh, you harvest them, and you keep them in a box <laughs> outside of the oxygen from the air, because otherwise the organic matter is going to be decomposed. Uh, but the idea is to harvest it and turn it into products. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe it can for, work uh, for food. <laughs> okay. Putting them in the mouth of a volcano. Yeah, just a, a comment of what just have been said. Uh, I, I talked with a bi biologist about this uh, dissolution, and he said to me that like the only way we can do it is in a like in a in a, in a pool or uh, something closed because there's an issue with uh, the sun and the light going through the the ocean. Like if we create this kind of forest uh, in a place which is not supposed to be a forest, we can de uh, destroy the the environment and the biodiversity because the light doesn't go anymore into into the, the environment. And I wanted to ask a qu very practical question about, we talked about um, the thermal um, energy. Do you think it's like we have to do it in a very decentralized way, like house by house, or we can also think about an industrial uh, scale of uh, producing energy with them? I have no idea. I think, I think, uh... It depends whether we're talking about because there are many forms of term, geothermal energy and there's low temperature, high temperature, and I think they should be considered very differently. The high temperature is really high. You can make uh, energy out of it. You can make electricity out of it. Uh, this is what they do in Iceland, for example, because Iceland is a volcanic area, so there is a lot of heat. Uh, but uh, when uh, we talk about low uh, temperature uh, geothermal energy. I think it can be used at the scale of your house or a community of ours. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's very different. Huh? Thank you.